ring opening of an epoxide. Be the topic of this lesson, and it turns out it happens under one of two conditions, either in the presence of a strong nucleophile or acid catalyzed ring opening of epoxide, and we are going to see the difference between the two in this lesson. Now I'm presently adding a few lessons a week to my organic chemistry playlist here, and if you want to be notified every time I post a lesson, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so this is really the only major set of reactions we're going to do for uh, epoxides here, and uh, I chose cyclic epoxides here. These don't have to be cyclic by any stretch of the imagination here. So, uh, but I want to show you the difference here. And some people call this base catalyzed ring opening epoxide and acid catalyzed ring opening epoxide, but calling it base catalyzed is not really the best term because uh, it's with a, in the presence of a strong nucleophile. And again, most strong nucleophiles are also strong bases, but calling it base catalyzed probably is a little bit of a misnomer here. And so. The way this works, if you take a look at the two carbons of the epoxide here, so both these carbons have a fair amount of partial positive charge because they're bonded to the oxygen, and that makes them a little bit electrophilic here. And it turns out the ring strain here, so is what ultimately adds to that electrophilicity. So a normal ether, the partial positive carbons of an ether aren't all that reactive with much of anything. So, but for the epoxide, they are. And so as a result, notice any kind of other cyclic ether is just an ether. But for a three-membered ether like this, it gets its own special name because it does a whole host of reactions here, these ring openings that none of the other ethers do. And so epoxides due to ring strain here, much more reactive than all the other ethers, which I guess I shouldn't call them all the other ethers because we don't really consider this uh, an ether. It gets its own class of functional group. It's an epoxide. All right, so if you do this in the presence of a strong nucleophile, it turns out whichever of these two carbons is less substituted, it's going to do backside attack on that carbon. So in this case, I've got sodium methoxide here. So and with a negative charge on oxygen, so being ionic, that's a strong nucleophile. And that strong nucleophile will come and attack the less substituted side. And again, if this happens to be a chiral center, it is backside attack. So you will see inversion of configuration if it's a chiral center, as is the case here. That's why, actually why one of the reasons I chose it to be sick, like it's easier to see that inversion of configuration. And so in this case, the backside, if this leaving group, and notice it doesn't leave the whole molecule, but it is leaving this carbon, uh, is from the wedge, then we're going to attach our OCH3 from the dashed position. Cool. Now this oxygen is still bonded through the wedge on the other carbon. There's no inversion taking place there because we're not breaking this bond. So, and then a methyl group right out here. So no inversion here. So, and then from here, we're just simply going to protonate that oxygen. So, and this takes place at an alcohol. If you've got a protic solvent, if that's possible for your particular nucleophile, then you're just going to protonate it from that solvent like we'll do right here. And that gets us to our product here. All right, so that is in the presence of a strong nucleophile, attack the less substituted side. That's a great steadfast rule. So with acid catalyzed, on the other hand, it's going to be a little more of a pain in the butt. So, and you'll notice acid catalyzed because you're going to see an acid. Like here I wrote H plus and made it generic. This I just very well could have written H2SO4. And when you do these acid catalyzed, you're typically not going to have a strong nucleophile. So here our nucleophile is going to be an alcohol and with no negative charge, that is just a weak nucleophile. You guys learned uh, that water and, and uh, alcohols are weak nucleophiles. So in this case, it needs help. Without the acid, this reaction actually wouldn't go. And uh, it turns out the first step is actually to protonate the oxygen when you're under acidic conditions. And so in this case, if you've got a strong acid and an alcohol, you're typically going to protonate that alcohol. Just like when you have strong acid in water, you protonate the water and form hydronium. Well, this is the equivalent of hydronium for an alcohol. And so in this case, that's actually probably what actually protonates this. And so that's why I've drew one of those out. And in this case, we've now protonated our epoxide. So, and by protonating that epoxide, we've now made this actually significantly more reactive. With a positive oxygen here, these two carbons, once again, so are even more partially positive. That oxygen is even more electron withdrawing. And so these are even better electrophiles. The question now is where's our weak nucleophile 
going to attack. And this is the tricky part. So, so first off, you should realize that this is also going to be backside attack. If we attack and form a chiral center, it will be inverted. So that's the tricky part. So this is SN2-like in that sense. So, but it turns out with the positive oxygen, because these two carbons have a significant, you know, amount of greater partial positive charge, they're a little bit carbocation-like. And so in a sense, this reaction becomes more SN1-like as well. And so we got two things competing here. If we're looking for the best backside attack, well, we'd still pick the less substitute side. But because it's a little bit SN1-like in the transition state, we're now looking for the best carbocation, which we choose the more substituted side. And so these are the two things that are competing. And the question is, who wins? Well, it depends on your alcohol. Now, this is actually taught in two ways, the truth and a lie. And it turns out the lie is actually more common. So for acid catalyzed ring opening epoxide, so because it is more now SN1-like, whereas in with strong nucleophile, it's totally just SN2-like. With it being a little bit SN1-like, a lot of uh, professors and textbooks even will teach this and just say, attack the more substitute side, which would be this one. And that's the lie though. And so but that's the lie that most of you be on the hook for. So if that's the way it was presented in your class, run with it. Base catalyzed, less substitute side, acid catalyzed, more substitute side. But the truth is actually this. So it turns out it is most reactive for tertiaries and then primaries and then secondaries. So it turns out if you got a tertiary carbon, then the SN1-like carbocation-like uh, transition state is the most important factor. But if your primary backside attack is the most important factor, and then secondary is just actually the least reactive position. So if we go back and identify these here, the top carbon right here is bonded to one, two, three other carbons and is tertiary, whereas the bottom one here is bonded to two other carbons and is secondary. And so our tertiary is gonna win. Now this example, had you just memorized that it attacks the more substituted side, you'd still have got this one right because tertiaries are more reactive than secondaries. It's so that stupid primary in this funky sequence that's the, you know, the rub here. So again, if you've been presented with this, that just an acid catalyzed ring opening epoxide attack the more substituted side, great, run with it. But if you've actually been told the truth, well, here it is. Tertiaries, then primaries, then secondaries. So in this case, we'll attack that tertiary carbon. So, and again, that's where alcohol come and do backside attack. And it is still backside attack. And we'll break open the ring of the epoxide. And again, it was backside attack. And so now it's the alcohol that's attached from the dash position. And so where the methyl group used to be, that's now going to be a wedged methyl group instead. Cool. On the other side, we haven't broken this bond at all. And so no inversion at the carbon we didn't attack. That's still just a wedge now to the OH, the alcohol here. And so as you've seen in a couple of other places, if you end a reaction with a positively charged oxygen, you're simply going to deprotonate it from whatever your solvent is. In this case, from the alcohol itself. And so another one's going to come along, deprotonate this so we don't end up with a positive charge on oxygen. Cool, so the ring opening epoxide, we're typically gonna make an alcohol here in both whether it's strong nucleophile or with an acid catalyzed version. The question is just where did your nucleophile add? So again, with a strong nucleophile, your nucleophile adds and ends up on the less substitute side. So, but with acid catalyzed, it might end up on the other side as it does in this case. And so as a result, these make great synthesis questions because it really, you know, makes you evaluate what kind of conditions was this performed under. Now we got one last little thing to look at here. So that's a tricky example of in the presence of strong nucleophiles. And I say it's tricky, it's not really tricky on purpose, it's just tricky the way it looks. Uh, let's get that epoxide. So let's say you're doing something like a Grignard addition. Well, a Grignard is a really strong nucleophile. And if you recall, we learned in the alcohol chapter that a Grignard reagent is such a strong base that it can't be uh, you know, present with anything protic. So the solvent you'd use if you're doing the Grignard reaction would not be a protic solvent. And so the problem is, is that when you form your alkoxide after step one, it can't get protonated from the solvent because the solvent's not protic. Okay, and so what you end up having to do just like with any Grignard reaction, is a separate acid workup step. And so in this case, that Grignard is still going to attack the less substitute side, so you're going to add a methyl group right there. It 
it's still going to add from the back side. And so I'm going to actually draw it out as a CH3 so you can see that it's coming, that it's that CH3, but I realized that's also a methyl group and I didn't draw it in, but just wanted to make sure it appears just as it did when I listed it as a reagent. So, and it did attack from the backside, so it's now a dash. And so this is your product. So what gets confusing here is a lot of students look at this and like, no, no, Chad, there's acid. It's acid catalyzed. No, it's not. So the key is acid catalyzed means there's acid present when the nucleophile attacks. There's acid present typically with a weak nucleophile when it attacks. And when that's the case, you have to protonate the epoxide first and then the nucleophile is going to come and attack. But notice we add our nucleophile first and our acid second in this kind of a setup. And so when the nucleophile attacks, there's no acid been added whatsoever. There's no acid present. We haven't protonated the epoxide and our strong nucleophile is simply going to attack that less substituted side. So with something like a Grignard here, I just want to make sure you're not going to get confused that this is not an acid catalyzed. This is just another example of ring opening of epoxide in the presence of a strong nucleophile. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? It really just enables a lot of other students to see this same lesson. And if you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you're looking for practice problems, chapter tests, practice final exams, final exam reviews, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. A free trial is available.